Would you please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 4, and I'm going to read for you from verse 23 to verse 31. Acts chapter 4, from verse 23 to 31. Once you have it, please say Amen. amen. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported to them what the chief priests and the elders said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign God, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them you spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot together in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did this by what your power and your will had long beforehand decided should happen. Now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of your servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God boldly. Please pray with me. We stand before you, Heavenly Father, anticipating a word from you. We pray you will speak to our lives. We will listen to your voice and that you will touch our hearts in a real way for the glory and the honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are now coming to the last of our series of sermons on prayer. But before we close out that series completely, how about we talk about powerful praying? What do I mean by that? By that expression, almost like last week, I'm referring to the kind of prayer that yields results, the kind of prayer that moves the hand of God. I suspect that many times you have gone to the prayer closet and walked out unsure of whether your prayers have had any impact or have had any power. And when that kind of thing happens, 
you begin to wonder whether uh, you should continue praying at all. Almost the majority of the church today, a good portion of the church today, seems impotent and irrelevant, specifically because we don't keep praying until something happens. We begin with a lot of enthusiasm, but down the road, that enthusiasm dies off. We get too tired to pray, and sometimes we put it as the last item on the grocery list of things that need to be done, uh, and we say we have more important things to do, forgetting that prayer is just as important. I have been there. I have done it. And I suspect you too have been there and have done it because you find yourself dealing with a whole range of emotions regarding prayer, a whole range of feelings regarding prayer, from feelings of tiredness to feelings of sleepiness, from being bored to being busy, from being skeptical to being doubtful. We wrestle with those kinds of things. But I want to tell you something I believe is very important. I really believe that if 100% of every member of all the people at Geneva, United Methodist Church, would gather together to pray for just one item, just one item, it could be one of the items that we've prayed about this morning, I believe God will move. I believe God will answer us in his own way. And I say that because when you read the book of Esther, you realize that all the believers in Esther's day gathered together to pray, or at least purposed to pray together, to fast really, because their race was in danger. And they fasted for three days, not eating anything or drinking anything. And after their three days of prayer, in fact, during their three days of prayer, God moved, even though his name is not mentioned in that book at all. Or you think of this passage of scripture that we're just looking at here. Those were 100% of all the believers at that time. They gathered together to pray, 100% of them, and asked that God would empower them to speak his word boldly. And when that happened, and they prayed and lifted their hearts to God, God moved and he affirmed, acknowledged their prayers. I believe the same can happen for us today. I believe, for example, that if we call on God as all the believers at First United Methodist Church of Geneva, all of us join in one accord, God will hear, God will move, God will answer us. If we want to see the drug problem and the alcohol addiction in our community go, go away, if we want to have our relationships restored, if we want people running to the altar in holy surrender, accepting and giving their lives to Jesus Christ, I think 100% of, of us have got to come together to pray, to call on God and ask Him to move in our lives. I strongly believe that. I'm absolutely convinced about that. That's exactly what happened here in the passage we are looking at today. If you remember, Paul, Peter and John had just healed a lame man at the beautiful gate, or at the gate called Beautiful, at the entrance to the temple in Jerusalem. They were going there to pray. And because of healing that man, and then proclaiming that this Jesus whom they crucified was the one responsible for that healing, they were arrested by the chief priests and the elders who, had them, who told them to stop praying and preaching in the name of Jesus and teaching in the name of Jesus. So upon their release from jail, they went back, Paul and Peter and John went back to their people and they reported what had happened. That gives me three things that I would like to leave with you when it comes to powerful praying, the ingredients, if you like, of a powerful prayer. Powerful praying comes when 
First of all, we participate in the worship of God. Secondly, powerful prayer comes when we proclaim the word of God. Third, powerful praying comes when we pursue the will of God. Let's begin with the first one. Powerful praying comes when we participate in the worship of God. Notice in verse 24 how they are participating in the worship of God. We are told that when they heard the report that they have been told not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, they raised their voices together. That's how they began. And then prayed to God. And in their prayer they began with praise. They began with worship. They began with adoration. They said, Sovereign God. They acknowledged the sovereign of God. That was their first move. Their second move is that they acknowledged God as creator. They said, you created the heavens. You created the earth. You created the sea. You created everything in the heavens. Everything in the earth. Everything in the sea. You created all these. They acknowledged his sovereignty. But they acknowledged his creative power. They began by praising God and acknowledging Him and worshipping Him. Have you noticed how we worship dignified people, dignitaries, when we are around them? We really do. When we are before a judge, we say, you honor the judge. When we are before the politicians, we'll tell them, you honor, honorable politician. When we are before a king, we say, your majesty the queen, your majesty the king. When we are before a president, we say, Your Excellency the President. Or when you are before the mayor, you say, You worship the mayor. We seem to worship these guys because their office seems to demand it. But when we come face to face with God, He demands that we worship Him. He demands that we acknowledge His sovereignty. He demands that we acknowledge His power as the all-powerful being whose power comes across is exemplified by His ability to create anything from nothing. Or we acknowledge the fact that He knows everything. We acknowledge the fact that He is here with us. That He is omnipresent. God wants you to worship Him for starters. God wants you to recognize who he is. He wants you to be aware of his resume so to speak so that you would know the one to whom you're placing your requests or before whom you're placing your requests. He wants you to know that so that once you're aware that this God you're praying to is all-powerful, all-loving, all-kind, omnibenevolent, omniscient. He wants you to know that once you're aware of this, you can trust him to deliver on your requests. He's qualified to answer your prayers. Powerful prayer comes when we participate in worship. And that's why... If worship is something you can do without, don't expect any power to come out of your praying. If not coming to church is something you can do without, don't expect any worship to any, any power to come out of your praying. Worship is something you do all the time, not just every Sunday, but all the time. Recognizing God for who He is. Powerful praying comes when we participate in worship. Secondly, powerful praying comes not only when we participate in worship, but also when we proclaim the Word of God. Powerful praying comes when we participate in the worship of God. Secondly, powerful praying comes when we proclaim the Word of God. Notice in verse 20. 5, 26 and 27 how they proclaim the Word of God in three stages. Stage number one, they recalled the word of God when they said, you spoke. They recalled the word of God when they said, you spoke. In their prayers, by the way, they said, you spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. That's phase one of proclaiming the word of God. Phase two, they repeated the word of God. They began repeating Psalm 2, verse 1 and 2, which says... Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples 
conspire? Why do the peoples plan together? Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? And then it continues to say, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against his anointed one. They are recalling and they are repeating the word of God, phase three, they are recognizing the fulfillment of the word. It begins with the word indeed. They are saying, yeah, that word we just recalled and repeated, it's, we recognize that it's being fulfilled. So he says, indeed, or they say, indeed. Uh, you have Herod and Pontius Pilate who conspired, they met together with the Gentiles and the rulers of Israel and the people of Israel and they conspired against your holy servant. So they recalled, they repeated and they recognized the fulfillment of God's word. And then in verse 28, it is a commentary saying that they did this because God's power and will had long beforehand decided it should happen. Have you noticed that God has his signature all over the Bible? Did you know? I'm sure you did, but I'm asking you. Did you know that anytime you put your signature on a document, you're binding yourself to the terms of that covenant, to the terms of that document? That's why they tell you to read the fine print before you put your signature on it, because you could miss, miss something very important. And the Bible has God's signature all over it. Sometimes you hear in various translations, you hear the Lord saying, thus says the Lord. Or, I the Lord have spoken. He's putting his signature there saying, hey, you can take it to the bank, my word will be fulfilled. And that's why when you're praying, you got to open, pray with an open Bible and speak God's word back to him, telling him, you signed it. So honor it. Honor your word, fulfill it. Follow through on it. You signed your word. And so you can begin claiming his promises, telling God, you've promised that you will supply all my needs according to your riches in glory. You've said that without you, I can do nothing. You've said that if I believe and trust anything I ask for you in prayer, you'll give it to me. Give God back his word. So you speak God's word back to him and call on his name. Powerful praying comes, first of all, when we participate in the worship of God. Secondly, powerful praying comes when we proclaim the word of God. And third, powerful praying comes when we pursue the will of God. Notice how in their prayer, they are pursuing the will of God. In verse 29, consider their threats and enable your servant to preach your word with great boldness. God had already told them that he wants his word to preach, to be preached to all the ends of the world, to the, all the ends of the earth. And so they are saying, your will is that. So give us the power to do it, equip us to do it. Stretch forth your hand to heal and to perform great miracles and wonders and signs in the name of your holy servant Jesus. Basically pursuing the will of God, telling God to perform what he said he would perform, to do what he said he would do, to accomplish what he said he would accomplish. They were pursuing the will of God and they were saying, we want to be at the heart, at the center of that will. Several years back when I was pastoring a church in Lexington, Kentucky, I received a prayer request in the same way that I received them here. And one such request asked me to pray for the University of Kentucky basketball team to defeat, defeat the rival team that was coming from out of state. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, my goodness, there might just be a pastor in that rival state praying that God would make the team that's coming to play Kentucky to defeat Kentucky. And I wondered, what if that team would have been the Florida Gators? And you're sitting here and you're a supporter of Florida Gators. And I'm praying, God, would Kentucky please defeat Florida Gators? You will probably disagree with me. 
Because I'm sure we have at least one Florida Gator fan. There we go. So you see, in such instances, you're creating a conflict of interest. So you know what I did? I said, no, I don't think I'm going to pray that prayer. This is the prayer I'm going to pray. First of all, that God's will be done. Amen. Secondly, I'm going to pray that all the players come out without injuries. Okay. And may the best team win. Okay. And that's where I stopped her. If you want power in your prayers, if you want power in your prayers, you must pray in accordance with the will of God. But how do you do that? You pray in accordance with the will of God when you accomplish three things. Number one, that prayer must be consistent with the word of God. Your request must be consistent with the word of God. Number two, your prayer requests must seek answers that will give God the glory, that will honor God. And number three, the motives for which you are praying must be pure. They must be pure. You must have pure motives in your prayers. And that's why I challenge you to remember that power in prayer, powerful praying comes when we participate in the worship of God, when we proclaim the word of God in prayer and we pursue the will of God in just that very prayer. It is interesting how after the disciples incorporated these three ingredients in their prayer, God honored it. God moved. God acknowledged it. God confirmed it. God stood by his word. And he moved powerfully and mightily. And I believe we can see the same if we remain committed to that very call, to that very goal. We'll see God moving like never before, God working like never before, God touching lives like never before because he is God. We'll see him acknowledge our prayers. He may not shake the world like he did. He may not rock it like a cradle with a baby on it. He may not do that like a rocking chair, but he will touch lives. He will change lives. He will move. And that's why I challenge you to begin a life of prayer if you're not doing it already. In fact, may I suggest to you, that person you talk with every week, that person you call upon or you call on every week to check on him or her. Why not take it a step further and pray with that person? Pray for your needs. Pray for his needs. Do it once a week. And in your prayers, participate in the worship of God. Proclaim the word of God. Claim God's promises and give, it, give the promises back to God. And three, uh, just pray that you would pursue the will of God. There will be power coming out of that prayer. And when you do it, let me know. I want to take it, put it down as my record. But there's a second thing I want you to pray for. I want you to pray for this church. Pray for this church when you're calling each other to pray together. Don't just talk about the gators. Talk about God. Say, isn't God wonderful? Yeah, but also pray for this church that God's purposes will be accomplished here. But there's a third thing I want you to do when you're calling each other. And that's selfish. Pray for me. It is hard. It is hard coming up with a sermon every Sunday. Now, I've done it for years. And it's never been easy. It is tough. That God would speak to you when I stand up here to declare his word. That I'd have the strength to do it. It is tough. And I'm not getting any younger. So pray that God would strengthen me. I hope you receive that word. Power in prayer comes when we participate in worship. Always worship God in your prayers. Power in prayer comes when you proclaim the word of God. Always give God back his word and tell him to accomplish it. Third, power in prayer comes when we pursue his will. Do you receive that? Amen. Let us pray. God, we worship you and bless you and honor you and glorify your name. Let your word come alive in our lives. Move in a mighty way. 
glorify yourself. And Father, we pray that you would stand by your word as you have said that your word is powerful. And just like rain comes from the clouds and waters the earth and fulfills the purposes for which you've sent it, so is your word. It doesn't come back to you empty. Stand by your word in the lives of your children. And Lord, bring the healing and restoration they need and grace and mercy. Thank you. We honor you. We bless you. We praise you. Bless your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.